Okay, hello everybody. This is Nick from NickyBlue.com. Uh, today I'm running the Dystopia in Focus podcast. And today we have Simon J. Tilbury, who is a musician, writer, and currently working on a PhD uh, on American poetry. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good, good, good. So I'm going to ask you to choose your favourite dystopian movie. Okay, well, it might be an obvious choice, but it's Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Great. It's classic. It is. Utterly classic. And and you have something you're leafing through in front of me very proudly. Would you like <laughs> to tell us what that is? Yeah, this is a 1982 illustrated... It's called the Blade Runner... Actually, no. It's called the Blade Runner Illustrated. And uh, it's an illustrated version of the screenplay from 82... And uh, it's illustrated by Ridley Scott's storyboards, which are famously called Ridley Grams. And it's, uh, it's a thing of beauty. It is a thing of beauty. And you've defaced it. Me? No, not defaced <laughs> it. I augmented it. Oh, did you? Back in the day, yes. Uh, it came out in 1982 when I was 13. And uh, when it was available on TV or VHS, I forget which... Uh, I added to it the uh, lines of the script that don't appear, that appear in the film, but not in this published script. Right. So we, really ha we have a true Blade Runner geek with us. You could say that. I've probably Great. seen it oh, dozens and dozens of times, probably almost as many as 100 times. Wow, okie doke. So for yeah. those of the listeners out there that haven't seen Blade Runner, could you please give us a brief synopsis? Yes, it's set in 2019, I believe, um, which is rapidly coming up on us. Um, and it's set in a dystopian future after um, possibly a nuclear war, which it's, it remains vague in the movie. But uh, Earth is, for the most part, a destroyed wasteland. Um, most animal species uh, have been wiped out and we find ourselves in a fairly, fairly deserted metropolis. In places it's densely populated, but in many of its places it's empty. That's because humanity has mostly been either wiped out by this um, unnamed war or a lot of humanity has um, emigrated, so to speak, to the planets of the solar system, also called off-world. And um, in the off-world um, planets, uh, one, of the, one of the perks, one of the incentives to move off-world uh, is the gift of an artificial human called a replicant, who is flesh and blood, but is manufactured. And a replicant is basically a slave. And uh, these slaves are banned on earth, considered to be less than human. Ha they have absolutely no, no rights, no privileges. And uh, the plot of the movie is that um, four or five of these replicants have somehow made it back to earth for unknown reasons. And our hero, Rick Deckard, played by Harrison Ford, is tasked uh, in true, true film noir fashion, is tasked with uh, one last job um, to eliminate these replicants, which is not called execution, it's called retirement. Wonderful, wonderful. So what what would uh, what stood out about the film for you? Uh, it's at the age of thirteen you saw it, you say. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and what meaning do you take from the film? I didn't understand it um, initially. It was very dense, um, even though it had the voiceover, which has now been removed from the so-called director's cut and the final cut. Um, I didn't understand a great deal of it, but what I did understand I fa found fascinating. Uh, and it was the theme of discovering what it is to be human 
Um, but to say that is, uh, oh, how to say, it's, it's actually very difficult to describe the movie because it's so rich in themes. The artificial humans, the villains, the replicants, although they are artificial, they seem to have more humanity than the human characters. They seem fascinated with their experience. They are fighting to um, gain more years of life. Part of their manufacture is that they are only given four years of life. This is really to control them, to, 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 keep, to keep their experience, to keep them so naive that they can be uh, controlled and manipulated. But they are developing some emotional maturity in the movie. And this is coupled with a naive fascination for their experience. And they also seem to show the friendship, the, the, the human qualities, which the um, subjugated, exhausted, depressed human characters don't show one another. And also, it's just one of the most visually beautiful films I've ever seen. It's shot and it's edited as if it's a waking dream. And the lighting, the use of the liberal use of smoke and rain, the sort of the science fiction noir aesthetic is just ravishing. And I still think it's one of the most memorable and beautiful and shimmering movies I've ever seen. Fantastic, fantastic. So it's safe to say that it did have a personal impact on you? Yes, it did. Um, and and if I was to pick out one sequence, it would be the final sequence in which the um, major villain, the, the alpha male of the replicants, called Roy Batty, uh, we know is dying. He has hours or possibly even minutes to live. And he terrorises Harrison Ford's policeman, Rick Deckard. He chases him through um, the upper floors of a destroyed building. Um, and at the point at which he could let Rick Deckard die by falling off the edge of a building, he saves him. And he then delivers an astonishing speech about memory and about death and about the confounding tragedy of all the moments of a life that will be just, which will dissolve at the point of death. And I found that sequence contradictory, exciting, brutal, and, and just so surprising that there's this final moment in which Roy Batty shows his greater humanity by saving Deckard even actually as Deckard spits in his face. And uh, as Batty delivers this final speech, Rick Deckard watches him die. And it's just, well, I've never seen any sequence like it in movies before or since. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. And of course, exciting <laughs> times, because from that age of uh, 13 up until your current age well more mature age we won't say what it is uh, you have the sequel to look forward to which is due mm. out soon which i think is due out in october of this year okay. 2017 okay i think it's called blade runner 2049 so it's set 30 years uh, after the original movie harrison ford's in it i've got good feelings about it because it's scripted by hampton fancher who co-scripted the original screenplay and it's directed by Denis Villeneuve, a Canadian director who has just done the rather superb sci-fi Arrival. Oh, yeah. He has a powerful visual um, directing style and is, I would argue, um, a director of ideas. And there are very few directors who are brave enough to sort of marry decent intriguing um, um, challenging ideas 
with powerful visuals. Mm. So I am excited. High hopes then. High hopes, yes. Exciting stuff. Okay. <clears throat> so then we're going to lead on to the final question that I have today, which I'm going to be asking people as a general theme. Uh, given the sort of current political backdrops that we have in the West, why is it, and, and coupled with the fact that you can't seem to move for dystopian books and new series uh -huh. and young adult dystopia and it seems to be everywhere. What is it you think that, why would you say that the, uh, this dystopian genre has become so popular and what is it that people get from watching it? Um, apart from the um, obvious sci-fi pleasures of uh, the genre pleasures of action and spaceships and uh, technology, uh, which of course isn't to be discounted. I think what dystopian movies do uh, is something particularly interesting. And uh, I'm drawing this from a book on the philosopher Adorno. Adorno talked about um, expressionist cinema and art of the 1920s and he said expressionism had traditionally been been thought to be um, deep neuroses or deep emotional trauma distorting the perception of the outside world he reverses that and he says that uh, expressionist art actually shows the real conditions under which we live in modern capitalist society he calls it the administered world. It's a world in which ideolo ideology distorts um, real relations between people. It reduces individuals to um, capitalistic um, robots, if you like. The replicants in Blade Runner are pure commodities. They have become less than human. They are slaves, commodified slaves, and the destroyed landscapes that we see in Blade Runner, The Matrix, lots of other dystopian movies, I believe they show in some stark allegorical fashion the distorted, destroyed, reified, subjugated world of capitalism and neo, the neoliberal landscape in which we are trapped and which our experience is saturated in. So they show the ideo ideological reality in which we live. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Good work. <laughs> so uh, that comes to the end of uh, Dystopia in Focus this week. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, if you'd like to join my mailing list, uh, please go along to Nikki, NikkiBlue.com. Uh, I'll be giving away a short dystopian story soon called The Way to Picasso, uh, which I'm working on at the moment. Uh, for Simon, please get onto Facebook and see his group Thoughts of Murnau. How do you spell Murnau? M-U-R-N-A-U. Uh, and you can read more of what he's up to there. And also, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please do share it with your friends. Many, many thanks, and hopefully see you soon.